Chapter 13. Vernal Conclave. Fulcrum City was a postmortal metropolis toward the very center of North America. There, by the river, set low between the sky soaring spires of graceful city living, was a venerable structure of stone, impressive if not in height, then in solidity. Marble columns and arches supported a great copper dome. It was an unyielding homage to ancient Greece and imperial Rome, the birthing grounds of civilization. It was still called the Capitol Building, for it was once a state capital, back when there were still states, in those days before government became obsolete. Now it had the honor of holding the administrative offices of the mid-American Scythum, as well as hosting its conclave three times a year. It was pouring rain the day of the vernal conclave. Saitra rarely minded the rain, but a day of gloom coupled with a day of pure tension did not sit well with her. But then, a bright sunny day would feel mocking. Saitra realized there was no good day to be presented to an intimidating elegy of sights. Fulcrum City was only an hour away by high paid rain, but of course, says Faraday, so how it bird rains as an unnecessary extravagance. Besides, I want the scenery rather than a windowless subterranean tunnel. I am a human being, not a mole. A standard rain took six hours, and Saitra did enjoy the scenery along the way, although she spent most of the trip studying. Fulcrum City was on the Mississippi River. She recalled that there was once a giant silver arc on the riverbank, but it was gone now, destroyed back in the age of mortality by something called terrorism. Sid had learned more about the city if she weren't so focused on her poisons and weapons. They had arrived the evening before Conclave, and stayed in a downtown hotel. Morning came much too quickly, as Saitra, Rowan, and Saiz Faraday walked from their hotel at the awful hour of 6.30 a.m., People in the streets ran to them and handed them umbrellas, choosing to get wet rather than see a scythe and his apprentices go without one. Do they know you've taken two apprentices instead of just one? Saitra asked. Of course they know, said Rowan. Why wouldn't they? But Saiz Faraday's silence on the matter was a clear red flag to Saitra. You did clear it with the high blade, didn't you, Saiz Faraday? I have found that with the scythe dome, it is better to ask forgiveness than permission, he told them. Cetra gave Rowan an I told you so look, and he cocked his umbrella slightly so he didn't have to see it. It will not be a problem, Faraday said, but he didn't sound very convincing. Cetra looked to Rowan again, who was no longer eclipsed by his umbrella. Am I the only one who's worried about that? Rowan shrugged. We have immunity until winter conclave, and it can be revoked. Everyone knows that. What's the worst they could do? Some sites arrived at the Capitol building on foot, as they had. Others in public cars, some in private cars, and several in limousines. There were ropes to hold back spectators on either side of the white marble staircase leading up to the building, as well as peace officers and members of the Blade Guard. The side them sell it. Security force. The arriving sites were protected from their adoring public, even if the public was not protected from them. I despise running the gauntlet, says Faraday said, referring to climbing the steps to Concliffe. It's even worse when it's not raining. The crowd on either side is a dozen people deep. Now, it was only half that. It never occurred to Saitra that people would come out to see sites arriving at Concliffe, but then, all celebrity events drew on lockers, so why not a gathering of sites? Some of the arriving sites gave obligatory waves, others played to be the crowd, kissing babies and randomly granting immunity. Saitra and Rowan followed far this lead, which was to ignore the crowd completely. There were dozens of other sites in the entire vestibule. They removed their raincoats to reveal robes of all colors, all textures. It was a rainbow that summoned forth anything but thoughts of death. This, Saitra realized, was intentional. Sights wished to be seen as the many facets of light, not of darkness. Through a grand arch lay a grander chamber beneath the central dome, 
a rotunda where hundreds of sides greeted one another, engaging in casual conversation around an elaborate breakfast spread in the center. Cedra wondered what it was that sides talked about, the tools of cleaning, the weather, the chaffing of their ropes. It was intimidating enough to be in the presence of a single site, to be surrounded by hundreds was enough to make one crumble. Sage Faraday leaned over and spoke to them in a hissed voice. See there, he pointed to a bald, heavily bearded man, Scythe Archimedes, one of the world's oldest living sites. He'll tell you he was there in the year of the Gondor, when the Scython was first formed, but it's a lie. He's not that bald. And over there, he pointed to a woman with long silver hair in a pale lavender robe. That's Scythe Curry. Saitra gasped. The Grand Dame of Death? So they say. Is it true she gleaned the last president before the Thunderhead was given control? Saitra asked. And his cabinet, yes. He looked at her, perhaps a bit wistfully. Saitra thought. Her actions were quite controversial back in the day. The woman caught them glancing her way and turned to them. Saitra chilled when her piercing grey eyes seared in her, on her. Then the woman smiled at the three of them, nodded, and returned to her conversation. There was a group of four or five sites closer to the assembly chamber entrance, the doors of which were still closed. They were bright robes studded with gems. The center of their attention was a scythe in royal blue, whose robe contained what appeared to be diamonds. He said something, and the others laughed a little too heartily for it to be anything but psychophantic. Who's that? Saitra asked. Saitfardi's expression took a turn towards her. That, he said, not even trying to hide his distaste, is Saith Goddard, and his company is best avoided. Goddard? Isn't he the master of mass cleanings? Rowan asked. Fardy looked at him a bit concerned. Where did you hear that? Rowan shrugged. I have a friend who is obsessed with that kind of stuff and he hears things. Saitra gasped, realizing she had heard of Goddard, not by name, just by deed. Or, more accurately, rumor because there was never any official report. But like Rowan said, you hear things. Is he the one who gleaned an entire airplane? Why? asked Farley, giving her a cold, accusing guy. Does that impress you? Saitra shook her head. No, the opposite. But she couldn't help but be a bit dazzled by the way the man's robe caught the light. Everyone was, which must have been his intent. And yet, his was not the most ostentatious robe on display. Moving through the crowd was a scythe in a lavishly gilded robe. The man was so large, his robe seemed a bit like a golden tent. Who's the fat guy? Saitra asked. He looks important, said Rowan. Indeed, said Saith Farday. The fat guy, as you call him, is the High Blade, the most powerful man in the mid American Scython. He presides over Conclave. The High Blade wore the crowd like a great gaseous planet, bending space around it. He could have tweaked his nanites to eliminate at least some of his girth, but clearly he had chosen not to. The choice was a bold statement, and his size made him an imposing figure. When he saw Faraday, he excused himself from his current conversation and made his way toward them. Honorable Scythe Faraday, always a pleasure to see you. He just bows his hands to grip Faraday's in what it was meant to be a heartfelt greeting, but felt forced and artificial. Saitra, Rowan, I'd like you to meet the High Blade Xenocrates. Faraday said, then turned back to the large man. These are my new apprentices. He took a moment to appraise them. A double apprenticeship, he said jovially. I believe that at first most sides have trouble with just one. The better of the two shall receive my blessing for the ring. And the other, said the high blade, will be sorely disappointed, I'm sure. Then he moved on to greet other sides that were just now coming in from the rain. See? Rowan said, and you were worried, but to Saitra, nothing about the man seemed sincere. Rowan was nervous, 
He just didn't want to admit it. He knew admitting it would make Saitra more worried, which would make him more worried. So he beat back his fears and misgivings and kept his eyes and ears open, taking in everything that happened around him. There were other apprentices there. He overheard two talking about how this was the big day, a boy and a girl, both older than him, maybe 18 or 19, would be getting their rings today and become junior sites. The girl lamented about how, for the first four years, they would have to get approval from the selection committee for their clinics. Every single one, she complained. Like we're babies. At least the apprenticeship isn't four years long, Rowan interjected, as a way to get into the conversation. The two looked at him with mild disgust. I mean, it takes four years to get a college degree, right? Rowan knew he was just digging himself deeper, but he had already committed. At least it doesn't take that long to get a license to glean. Who the hell are you? The girl asked. Ignore him, he's just a spot. A what? Rowan had been called many things, but never that. They both smirked at him. No, don't you know anything? said the girl. A spat, as in spatula, it's what they call new apprentices, because you're not good for anything but flipping your sides burgers. Rowan laughed at that, which just irritated them. Then Saitra came up next to them. So, if we're spatulas, what does that make you? Safety sizers? Or are you just a couple of tools? The boy looked like he might slack Saitra. Who's your mentor, Saiz? He asked him. He should be told of this disrespect. I am, said Farde, putting his hand on Saitra's shoulder. And you don't warrant anyone's respect until after you receive your ring. The boy seemed to shrink by about three inches. Uh, honorable Saiz Farde, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. The girl took a step away as if to distance herself from him. Best of luck today. He told them with a magnanimous gesture that they didn't deserve. Thank you, said the girl. But if I may say, uh, luck plays no part. We've both trained long and have been taught well by our sights. Very true, Faraday said. They nodded respectful goodbyes that bordered on bows and left. After they were gone, Faraday turned to Rowan and Saitra. The girl will get her ring today, he said. The boy will be denied. How do you know? asked Rowan. I have friends on the BU in committee. The boy is smart, but too quick, too quick to anger. It's a fatal flaw that cannot be tolerated. As annoying as Rowan found the kid, he couldn't help but feel a twinge of pity. What happens to the apprentices that get denied? They are returned to their families to take up life where they left off. But life can never be the same after a year of training to be a scythe, Rowan pointed out. True said Farday, but only good can come from a keen understanding of what it takes to be a scythe. Rowan nodded, but thought, for a man of such wisdom, that seemed very naive. Scythe training was a scoring endeavor, purposefully so, but it was a scoring nonetheless. The rotunda became increasingly crowded with scythes, and the marble walls, floor, and dome made voices echo into a cacophony. Rowan tried to hear more individual conversations, but they were lost in the din. Faraday had told them that the great bronze doors to the assembly room would open promptly at 7 a.m., and the sites would be dismissed at the stroke of 7 p.m. Twelve hours to accomplish any and all business. Anything left undone would have to wait four months until the next conclave. In the early days, said Faraday told them as the doors opened to admit the throng, a conclave would last for three days, but they discovered that after the first day, it became little more than arguments and posturing. There's still plenty of that, but it's curtailed. It behooves us all to move through the agenda quickly. The chamber was a huge semicircle with a large wooden rostrum at the front where the high plate sat, and slightly lower seats on either side for the conclave clerk, who kept records, and the parliamentarian, who interpreted rules and procedures if any questions arose. Saith Farday had told them enough about the power structure of the Scython for Rowan to know that much. The first order of business, once everyone was settled, was the tolling of the names. One by one, in no particular order, 
The sites came to the front to recite various names of people they had gleaned over the past four months. We can recite them all, Said Faraday told them. With over 300 sites, it would be more than 26,000 names. We are to choose them, the ones we most remember. The ones who died most bullyingly, the ones whose lives were the most notable. After each name spoken, an iron bell was rung, solemn and resonant. No one was pleased to hear Scythe Farday reciting Cole Whitlock's name as one of his chosen. The telling of the names got old very quickly for Scythera. Even reduced to ten name seats, the recitation lasted for almost two hours. It was novel that the sites saw fit to pay homage to the gleaned, but if they only had 12 hours to complete three months' worth of business, she didn't see the sense of it. There was no written agenda, so there was no way for her and Rowan to know what came next, and Sage Faraday only explained things as they happened. When is our thirst? Will we be taken somewhere else for it? Sage asked, but Faraday searched her. After the tolling of the names, the next order of business was a ceremonial washing of the hands. The sides all rose and lined up before two basins, one on either side of the rostrum. Again, Saitra didn't see the point. All this ritual, it's like something you'd see in a tone cult, she said when Faraday returned to his seat, hands still damp. Faraday leaned over to her and whispered, Don't let any of the other sides hear you say that. Do you feel clean after sticking your hands in water that a hundred other hands have been in? Faraday sighed. It brings solace. It binds us as a community. Do not belittle our traditions because one day they may be yours. Or not, go the Rowan. Setra shifted uncomfortably and grumbled. It just seems like a waste of time. Faraday must have known her real gripe was with not knowing when they would be presented to the conclave and taken away from their test. Cedra was not a girl who could endure being in the dark for long. Perhaps that's why Faraday made sure that she was. He was constantly poking at their weaknesses. Next, a number of sites were singled out for sowing BS in their clinics. This held some interest for Cedra and gave her some insight as to how it all worked behind the scenes. One scythe had gleaned too few wealthy people, she was reprimanded and assigned to only glean the rich between now and the next conclave. Another scythe was found to have racial radioises, high on the Hispanic, low on the Afric. It's due to the demographic where I live, he pleaded. People have a higher percentage of Hispanic in their personal ratios. High blade Xenocrates was not sweet. Then cast a wider net, he said. Glean Elsewhere, he was charged with bringing his radios back into line or face being disciplined, which consisted of having future clinics pre-approved by the selection committee. Having one's freedom to glean taken away was a humiliation that no scythe wanted. Sixteen scythes were taken to task. Ten were warned. Six were disciplined. The other situation was a scythe who was far too pretty for his own good. He had called out for gleaning too many unattractive people. What an idea! One of the other sides shouted out. Imagine what a world it would be if we gleaned only ugly people! That brought a round of laughter from the rest of the room. The scythe tried to defend himself, claiming the old adage. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but the high blade wasn't buying it. This was apparently his third such offense, so he was given permanent probation. He could live as a scythe, but could not glean. Until the next reptilian year, the high blade proclaimed. That's crazy, Saitra commented just loud enough for Rowan and Faraday to hear. No one knows what animals future years will be named after. I mean, the last reptilian year was the year of the year code, and that was before I was born. Precisely, said Faraday with a little bit of guilty glee. Which means his punishment could end next year, or never. Now, He'll spend his time lobbying the office of the Calendaria to name a year after the skink, or Gila monster, or some other reptile that has not yet been used. Before they moved on from the disciplinary portion of the morning, there was one more sight to be called out. It was 
It wasn't a matter of bias, however. I have before me an anonymous note, the High Blade said, which accuses Honorable Side Goddard of malfeasance. A rumble throughout the room. Saidra saw Scythe Goddard whisper to his inner circle of companions, then stood. Of what malfeasance am I being accused? Unnecessary cruelty in your cleaning? And yet this accusation comes anonymously, said Goddard. I cannot believe that a fellow Scythe would sow such cowardice. I demand that the accuser reveal his or herself. More rumbles around the room. No one stood up. No one took responsibility. Well then, said Goddard, I refuse to answer an invisible accuser. So it expected High Blade Xenocrates to press the issue. After all, an accusation from a fellow scythe should be taken seriously. But the High Blade put the paper down and said, Well, if there's nothing more, we'll take our mid morning break. And the scythes, Earth's grand bringers of death, began to file out into the rotunda for donuts and coffee. Once they were in the rotunda, Faraday leaned close to Scythe and Rowan and said, There was no anonymous accuser. I'm sure that Scythe Goddard accused himself. Why would he do that? asked Scythe. To take the steam out of his enemies. It's the oldest trick in the book. Now, anyone who accuses him will be assumed to be the cowardly anonymous accuser. No one will go after him now. Rowan found himself less interested in the stagecraft and powering within the assembly room as he was in the things that went on outside of it. He was already getting a feeling for the scythe dome and how it truly worked. The most important business did not occur within the bronze doors, but in the rotunda and dim alcoves of the building, of which there were many, probably for this exact purpose. The early morning conversations had been just small talk, but now, as the day progressed, Rowan could see a number of sites congregating during break into small groups, doing site deals, building alliances, pushing secret agendas. He overheard one group that was planning to propose a ban on remote donators as a method of cleaning, not for any ethical reason, but because the gun lobby had made a sizable contribution to a particular site. Another group was trying to groom one of the younger sites for a position on the selection committee, so that he might sway leaning choices when they needed those choices swayed. Power politics might have been a thing of the past elsewhere, but it was alive and seething in the scythe dome. Their mentor did not join any of the plotters. For they remained solitary and above petty politics, as did perhaps half of the sites. We know the schemes of the schemers, he told Rowan and as he negotiated a jelly donut. They only get their way when the rest of us want them to. Rowan made a point to observe Scythe Goddard. Many sides approached him to talk. Others grumbled about him under their breath. His interior of junior sides were a multicultural bunch, the old school meaning of the world. While no one had pristine ethnogenetics anymore, his inner circle saw traits that leaned toward one ethnos or another. The girl in green seemed mildly Panasian, the man in yellow had African leanings, the one in fury orange was a Caucasoid, as could be, and he himself leaned slightly toward the Hispanic. He was clearly a scythe who wanted high visibility, even his grand gesture of ethnic balance was a visible one. Although Goddard never turned to look, Rowan had the distinct feeling that he knew Rowan was watching him. For the rest of the morning, proposals were made and hotly debated in the assembly room. As Scythe Farday had said, the schemers only prevailed when the more high-minded body of the Scythe dome allowed. The ban on remote detonators was adopted, not because of bribes from the gun lobby, but because blowing people up was determined to be crude, cruel and beneath the Scythe dome and the young scythe put forth for membership on their selection committee was voted down, because no one on that committee should be in anyone's pocket. I should like to be on a scythe committee one day, Rowan said. Cedra looked at him oddly. Why are you talking like Faraday? Rowan shrugged. When in Rome, we're not in Rome, she reminded him. If we were, we'd have a much cooler place for conclave. Local restaurants viewed for the chance to go to their conclave, 
So lunch was a buffet out in the rotunda, even more sumptuous than the one at breakfast, and Faraday packed his plate, which was out of character for him. Don't think ill of him, said Curie to Rowan and Cetra, her voice mellifluous, yet sharp at the same time. For those of us who take our vow of austerity seriously, conclave is the only time we allow ourselves the luxury of fine food and drink. It reminds us that we're human. Cetra, who had a one-track mind, took this as her opportunity to get information. When will the apprentices be tested? she asked. Seth Chris smirked and brushed back her silky silver hair. The ones who were hoping to receive the ring today were tested last night. As for all the others, you'll be tested soon enough, she said. Saitra's frustration made Rowan snicker, which earned him a glare from Saitra. Just shut up and stuff your face, she said. Rowan was happy to blitz. As focused as Saitra was on the upcoming test, she began to wonder what in conclave she would miss when the apprentices were taken for testing. Like Rowan, she found Conclave to be an education like no other. There were few people beyond sites and their apprentices, whoever witnessed it, and those others who did caught only a glimpse, such as the string of salespeople after lunch, who were each given ten minutes to expound the virtues of some weapon or poison they were trying to sell to the Scython, and more importantly, the weapon's master, who had the final decision over what the Scython purchased. They sounded like those awful people on him for holograms, it dices, it slices, but wait, there's more. One salesperson was selling a digital poison that would turn the healing nanites in a person's bloodstream into hungry little bastards that would devour the victim from the inside out in less than a minute. He actually used the word victim, which immediately served the sites. He was flatly dismissed by the weapon master. The most successful salesperson was offering a product called Touch of Ketchup which sounded more like a feminine hygiene product than a death delivery system. The woman selling it displayed a small pill, but not to give to the subject. The pill was for the scythe. Take with water and within seconds your fingers will secrete a transdermal poison. Anyone you touch for the next hour will be instantly and painlessly cleaned. The weapon master was so impressed, he came up to the stage to take a dose, then in the ultimate demonstration, proceeded to clean the saleswoman. She sold 50 PLs of the stuff to the Scython posthumously. The rest of the afternoon consisted of more discussion, arguments, and votes about policy. Such far they only found fit to voice his opinion once, when it came to forming an immunity committee. It seems clear to me that there should be oversight for the granting of immunity. Just as the selection committee provides oversight for cleaning, Rowan and Saitra were pleased to see that his opinion carried a great deal of weight. Several sites who had initially voted against the forming of an immunity committee switched their vote. However, before a final tally was taken, Highblade Xenocrates announced that time had run out for legislative issues. The subject will be at the top of our agenda for the next conclave, he announced. A number of sides applauded, but several rose up and shouted their grievous discontent at the issue being tabled. Such far they did not voice his own displeasure. He took a long breath in and out. Interesting, was all he said. This might have all pinched loudly on Rowan and Saitra's rather, had the high blade not immediately announced that the next order of business was the apprentices. Saitra found herself wanting to grip Rowan's hand in anticipation and squeeze it until it was bloodless, but she restrained herself. Rowan, on the other hand, followed his mentor's lead. He took a deep breath in, then out, and tried to let his anxiety wash from him. He had studied all he could study, learned all he could learn, he would do the best he could do. If he failed today, there would be more than enough chances to redeem himself. Good luck, Rowan said to Saitra. You too, she returned. Let's make Seth Farday proud. Rowan smiled and thought that Farday might smile at Saitra as well, but he didn't. He just kept his gaze on Xenocrates. First, the candidates for Scythom were called up. There were four whose apprenticeship was now complete. Having had their final test the evening before, 
there was nothing left but to ordain them, or not, as the case may be. Ward was there, was a fifth candidate who had failed the final in the test last night. He or she wasn't even invited to conclave. Three rings were brought out, resting on red velvet pillows. The four looked to one another, now aware that even though they had passed their final test, one of them would not be ordained and would be sent home insane. Sage Faraday turned to the scythe beside him and said, Only one scythe cleaned himself since last conclave, and yet three are being confirmed today. Has the population grown so drastically in three months that we need two additional sites? The three chosen apprentices were called one by one by Scythe Mandela, who presided over the beulin committee. As each knelt before him, he said something about each of them in turn, and then handed them the rings, which they slipped on their fingers and held to sow the conclave, which responded for each of them with obligatory applause. Then they announced their pattern historic, the luminary from history whom they would name themselves after, the conclave applauded with each announcement, accepting sites Goodall, Schrodinger and Colbert into the mid-American sidebar. When the three had left the stage, the hot-tempered boy remained, just as Sage Faraday had said earlier in the day. He stood alone after the applause died down. Then Scythe Mandela said, Ransom Paladini, we have chosen not to ordain you as a scythe. Wherever life leads you, we wish you well. You are dismissed. He lingered for a few moments, as if thinking it might be a joke, or maybe one final test. Then his lips burst. His face turned red, and he strode quickly up the center aisle in the silence, pushing through the heavy bronze doors, three hinges complaining at his exit. How awful, said Saito. At least they could applaud him for trying. There are no accolades for the unworthy, Faraday said. One of us will exit that way, Rowan pointed out to her. He resolved that if it was him, he would take his time going down that aisle. He'd make a contact and not to as many sites as he could on his way out. Were he to be ejected, he would leave that final conclave with dignity. The remaining apprentices may now come forward, said Xenocrates. Rowan and Saitra rose, ready to face whatever the Scython had in store for them. I do believe people still fear death, but only one and one hundredth as much as they used to. I say that because, based on current quotas, a person's chance of being cleaned within the next 100 years is only 1%, which means the chance that a child born today will be cleaned between now and their 5,000th year on Earth is only 50%. Of course, since we no longer count the years numerically, Aside from children and adolescents, no one knows how old anyone is anymore. Sometimes, not even themselves. These days, people roughly know within a decade or two. At the writing of this, I can tell you that I am somewhere between 160 and 180 years old, although I don't enjoy looking my age. Like everyone else, I turned the corner on occasion and set my biological age back substantially, but like many sites, I don't set it back past the age of 40, only sites that are actually young like to look young. To date, the oldest living human being is somewhere around 300, but only because we're still so close to the age of mortality. I wonder what life will be like a millennium from now, when the average age will be nearer to 1000. Will we all be renaissance children, skilled at every art and science? because we've had the time to master them, or will boredom and slavish routine plague us even more than it does today, giving us less of a reason to live limitless lives? I dream of the former, but suspect the later. From the Gleaning Journal of H.S. Curie.